And we're, we're going to get started. So we have enough time also um, to have a you know, conversation about the work that's going to be presented uh, today. So folks just want to come in and grab a seat, that would be great. Um, so good afternoon. I'm Mabel Wilson. I'm a professor here uh, in architecture at GSAP. Also, I chair the steering committee on Studio X. Um, and so I wanted to welcome you to our second of a series called Architectural Practice in the City. Uh, in the fall, we were joined by architects um, based in Sao Paulo and Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, and Johannesburg, uh, South Africa. And this spring, um, it's a pleasure that we are going to be joined by the Istanbul-based firm Tejet, Tejet, and um, Kamash Architects based in Iman. Um, and a little bit about the series, which is, which probes how architects practice within an urban domain that. Um, that, most, uh, that must contend with the details of both locality, so the kind of local conditions, but also with the demands of globality and to kind of think through what practice is um, in, in these contexts. One of the themes um, that we'll discuss with um, this afternoon's um, practices is that how do architects actually build good projects in the public realm, particularly navigating the demands of government, um, of the people, of civic groups, but also considering uh, questions of land and water conservation, hist historical and cultural conservation, uh, but most importantly, thinking through the role of architecture in shaping people's understanding, experience, and inhabitation of the public realm. So we're going to hear um, from um, from one group of architects, we'll hear from the other group of architects, and then we'll have a sort of collective discussion, sort of talking comparatively um, about um, the nature of practice. Um, we are going to be joined today um, by um, the directors of Studio X, who in fact have extended the invitation to our, our practices today. Um, our first, um, uh, our, our the first directors um, will be uh, Selva Gerdigan, also joined by Gregor Tom, Tom, uh, Thomason of Superpool. A little bit about them, their multidisciplinary practice. Uh, Superpool has engaged in long-term studies of the complex urban architectural and social ecologies of the modern global city. Their various experimental research endeavors have, included, um, have been included in numerous exhibitions, among them most recently MoMA's Uneven Growth. They've been shown at the Guggenheim, the Rotterdam Architecture Biennale, and the Deutsches Architecture Museum. But they have also been architects for several exhibitions, including the UAE National Pavilion for the Venice Biennale, and most uh, recently, the Istanbul Biennale, both in 2014, 2016. As directors of Studio X, they have sponsored and hosted numerous civic activist design, cultural, and education, educational um, organizations. Um, who gather together to quote from the website, generate ideas, discuss, and even make mistakes, um, in quote, about the future of our cities and the lives those cities nurture. Um, Studio X will be, uh, Istanbul, the directors will be discussing the architects of Teget. Um, Nora Akawi, uh, who is the curator at um, Studio X Amman. Uh, Nora has led numerous research initiatives on the architecture of the Arab region. Her work investigates archives as well as the city as archive. Um, and her various and numerous, uh, and with her various collaborators and interlocutors, she engages um, in thinking through the future political imaginaries of our globalized world. She has lectured and published widely, uh, most, and, uh, most recently, a uh, really incredible volume co-edited with Dina Mal Andreas called The Arab City. And if you don't have that book, I really highly recommend it. It came out of an amazing conference, but I think it's a very important contribution to uh, thinking through uh, both architecture and um, urbanism. Nora has been teaching graduate urban design and history theory courses focused on urbanization, borderlands, forced migration, and human rights here at GSAP. As director of Studio X Aman, she leads the conceptualization and implementation of public programs and research initiatives on the architecture in the Arab regions by curating, often in, often in partnership 
with other researchers and institutions. Um, and Aman, I got emails today, um, is very, very active in terms of conferences, workshops, publications, screenings, uh, lectures, and other forms of collective cultural productions. Um, uh, Nora will be um, introducing and uh, having a conversation with Kamash Architects. So um, we're going to start with uh, Stella Gregors. Hello, it's a great pleasure to be introducing Friends to Friends here uh, today. Um, I'll do a brief introduction on Teot. Uh, Teot is an architectural practice established in Ankara in uh, 1996. They moved to Istanbul in 2000, um, in year 2000. Uh, we are together here with its uh, two founding partners, Mehmet Kutukcoğlu and Artu Uçar. Uh, Mehmet is a graduate of M Middle Eastern Technical University and has a graduate degree from SIARC. He has lectured in several universities, including, including SIARC and also Istanbul Technical University. Currently, he's teaching at Bilgi University, where he is also a, a member of the board of directors for the graduate program. Uh, Artu is also a graduate of Middle Eastern Technical University and has a master's degree also from the same institution. Uh, he has taught at Yildiz Technical University and Istanbul Technical University. Artu, I learned today, I realized today, is also a fiction writer, and he has three storybooks, which I hope to get them soon and uh, get it signed by him. Uh, Teot is a very inspiring practice uh, for those of us who uh, also practice in Istanbul. Uh, as, a, as an office that has stood the test of time over 20 years uh, and has not kind of uh, developed uh, st still a quite, I think, unique um, body of works that are not commercial, but that are actually in, becoming increasingly even more cultural. Uh, and they have won quite a few uh, prizes uh, to name. Uh, one of them will be the Maritime Museum that will be sh uh, shared with us today. Also the Izmir Opera House. And they were also the uh, participants in the inaugural um, edition of Turkish Pavilion at the uh, Venice Architecture Biennial. So, the work ranges from research done with students over the, over the, de over the decades at several institutions, and also uh, very interesting to me also uh, buildings that I always kind of am I'm inspired by by their spatial compos composition. So it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce both Mehmet and Artu to stage now. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming in this nice weather. Uh, we are indoor. Uh, I will start with some interior photos of Maritime Museum from the boathouse. Uh, after that, I will make a long, long introduction about Istanbul, so it is to prevent possible escapes. They are teasers. Uh, this is the collection of the Maritime Museum. This is the mezzanine floor. And this is Bosphorus. The Maritime Museum is placed by Bosphorus. Uh, Bosphorus is a, uh, is a natural uh, sea channel. Sorry. Uh, linking Black Sea and Marmara Sea. It, it is a 30 kilometer long uh, uh, sea channel. It's, it's natural and the, flat, uh, the land around it is not flat. So the, a series of soft hills and uh, valleys in between makes this meandering waterway a very, very beautiful place. Um, and, and this, you will see, uh, it, is, it is scaled very nicely. Uh, it is large enough to, to, to let the uh, super tankers and uh, large ships to uh, move in. And it is uh, narrow enough to, to build a suspension bridge on it. This is the first bridge, Bosphorus Bridge, uh, linking two continents, Asia and Euro Europe. Uh, actually, the, the, the historical nucleus of the city is on the south corner, on the European side. <clears throat> and after the, uh, after the construction of first and second bridges in 70s and 80s, city grow uh, to north very fast. And today, almost uh, two thirds of Bosphorus is uh, populated densely. Um, 
the the building typology uh, by Bosphorus coastline is is limited. Uh, there is a there is a law, Bosphorus law for for 30 years. Uh, it is to to define the rules of construction along the coastline. Uh, the rule is very simple. <clears throat> if you own a, own a plot uh, along the coastline of Bosphorus, and if you want to construct on it, you have to, you have to find the evidences of, of a former construction on that plot. Uh, the paintings, photographs, uh, even the remaining of, of a foundation. And after that, you can only you can only build uh, the, a, a replica of the of the former design on the coastline. So uh, the first building typology along Bosphorus is mansions, historical mansions. Today we have 600 of them. Uh, originally they are all wooden. This one is the the oldest one, dating to 15th century. Uh, secondly, we have we have stone rectangular prisms, palaces on the coastline. Uh, today, some of them are used by governmental institutions, some of them by uh, universities and hotels. Uh, and lastly, the the points, the monuments along the Bosphorus, the, uh, the mosques, fountains, and uh, but you can find uh, this. This Google map shows the uh, the southern corner. This is the historical peninsula. This is the first continental bridges bridge, and these points are palaces and uh, mosques uh, in that portion of the city. You see, this part uh, witnesses a very busy uh, daily. Uh, sea traffic uh, carrying people uh, from one side to to other. Uh, the maritime museum is number nine. Uh, <clears throat> the, the location of the maritime museum is a very busy one. You see uh, these perpendicular. Uh, access from the depths of the city and this one parallel to uh, coastline and uh, ferry lines they all meet at that point which is called Besiktas and maritime museum uh, with, with one facade it faces to this uh, to this plaza which is very energetic and lively uh, for 24 hours. Um, you see this parallel uh, axis, traffic axis along Bosphorus, it stops the city fabric and uh, in front of it, between this line and Bosphorus, it is another typology of big boxes. And Maritime Museum is one of them. Uh, it shows the, the situation before the competition. Uh, this, is the, this is the lot. Uh, in the corner, there is a historical, a two-story historical building, a former governmental institution. And this one is the uh, warehouse, the customs warehouse. Uh, we can uh, the inventory, the collection of the Maritime Museum, uh, we can uh, evaluate it in two, two parts, the small objects and the historical boat collection. So in the, in, the, in the former situation, the boat collection was kept in the, in the customs warehouse. Actually, they were stored there. We cannot uh, tell that that was an exhibition. Uh, it doesn't have the uh, proper conditions of an exhibition before. And in the historical building, there were small objects. Uh, this is the uh, preserved 
historical building. It is registered. Uh, and this, this is the former uh, Bosphorus facade of the uh, warehouse. And this one at the back is the neighborhood building. It's, it is also a customs warehouse, and it's, it is converted into a luxury hotel today. Um, Maritime Museum collection is a, is a unique one. It is the largest, it has the largest boat, historical boat collection in the world. Uh, it has 30 uh, boats from the Ottoman Empire. The important thing is uh, these, these boats, they were not uh, found in the depth of Marmara Sea and restorated by uh, marine archaeologists. They were kept intentionally for centuries as a uh, historical boat collection by Turkish Navy. Uh, this one is the main, main piece. Uh, it is 30 meter long and uh, five meter, maybe six meter height uh, for at the back. Uh, this photograph is from the 60s. Uh, in 1960s, they decided to found the Maritime Museum on that location I showed to you. Uh, and they, uh, they transferred uh, these boats uh, from other warehouses uh, and start to, uh, start to uh, found the museum. Um, this one is called Bashtarda, uh, and it is Originally, it, it is, it's an Italian word, il bastardo, uh, bastard. Uh, this ship typology is a, is a transition typology between the uh, sailed boats and or, oared boats. So because of that, it is called uh, bastard, il bastardo, and in Ottoman, bastarda. Uh, You see, these, this photograph is from the, uh, from the existing situation in 2000, actually 2005, it should be. And the small objects uh, were also uh, in that condition. Uh, this collection of uh, boats Actually, they are uh, they, they belong to another time and another location. It, they belong to to a Mediterranean of uh, 19th, 18th, and 17th century. Uh, Mediterranean is a is a landlocked sea. It, it's a, it is a reservoir uh, uh, where people shared common things like, I mean, clothes. Uh, food, construction techniques, architecture, uh, all the culture. Uh, it is carried by, by ships uh, throughout Mediterranean between, between the harbors. Um, you see this is a gravure from Istanbul and this is Venice. And this is Arsenale in Venice, the shipyard. And this is uh, the Ottoman era shipyard in Golden Horn. And you see, uh, we can, in Mediterranean, we can, of course, we can talk about a common architectural language, particularly in the context of marine architecture. Uh, the, the ship sheds, the ship sheds you see in Venice shipyard is very, very similar, almost the same with the ship sheds in, in, uh, in Istanbul uh, by Golden Horn. And this map shows uh, the past and present shipyards and harbors in Istanbul. In that corner, number one is uh, Yenikapı Harbor. Uh, 
the harbor of Byzantine era, uh, around 10th, 11th century. Uh, the second is uh, Halic Goldenhorn uh, shipyard and harbor. It is the harbor of uh, Ottoman era. And the third one is in Galata. It is the harbor of the Republican era. And fifth one is the uh, existing harbor today, the trade port uh, of Haydar Pasha. And the number four is Maritime Museum. You see these, uh, these ship sheds. It is around 17th century, I think. These are buildings perpendicular to sea. Uh, they are dimensioned and shaped uh, by the di uh, according to the dimensions of the ships. You see these series of shipyards, ship sheds here, and warehouses, and this huge one is a wooden one. It is a, it, how do we call it, wet pool, Mehmet? Wet pool, yes. wet pool. Uh, yeah. Yes. I will leave it to you. Thank you. <coughs> we are partners. <laughs> so, as our two uh, let's say, intentions of the design from there. Uh, we decided to use uh, the typology of the ship shape, which we call in Turkish göz, which means eye, this slender uh, rectangle, which is exactly, which takes on the shape and dimension of the boats. Uh, in Italian, volti, uh, and they are repetitive, as you, you have seen. Uh, in the shipyard. Uh, so we decided, because we have a beautiful collection with a number of boats, we decided to use this typology and uh, how they uh, are combined together. We have this, let's say, uh, the simple representation of the collection here. Uh, and uh, we had the straightforward uh, chronological uh, organization boats because this boat gallery is uh, the most probably would be the most important space uh, in this museum and we decided to face it against uh, Bosphorus. Uh, and uh, when we uh, use the chronological order of course there would be let's say discrepancies the dimensional discrepancies so uh, it has to be almost like a fractal facade towards both stories to allow us different lengths uh, uh, for the boats. But uh, this section reveals the idea that we are using, uh, let's say, separate boaty ship shed for each boat, at the same time uh, creating a hol holistic space, a single space. So these two, uh, uh, let's say, arguments, uh, they stand in a paradox. But uh, as usual, architecture is a good, let's say, uh, activity to, uh, let's say, deal with paradoxes, actually to build uh, paradoxes. This, uh, this is revealing how we dealt with, with that paradox to individualize the space, but at the same time uh, to create a single space. Uh, we use a structural idea. Uh, as you see, we have here seven bridges uh, detached from each other. And these bridges uh, have dimensions from 25 to 50 meters. Uh, and uh, the space is uh, not a box, an enclosed and sealed box. It's a series of 
bridges and then uh, a series of closings. Uh, of course, then the number of, let's say, uh, uh, opportunities to provide uh, daylight, sunlight, both from the facade and also from the roof. So it's, it's like a fiber structure, not a single, let's say, seal box that uh, are usually the, the, uh, uh, the engineers and the museum uh, specialists uh, would suggest. <clears throat> So uh, this shows the idea and how we uh, deal with the, with the boat inventory. These are some study models. Uh, I think uh, during the competition, which was in 2004, if I'm mistaken, uh, and uh, this was the latest uh, that we decided to start from here. <coughs> And this is showing you how we, let's say, weave the space with this structure. And these are some, let's say, panoramic inside perspectives uh, that we produce for the competition. And uh, here it is important that uh, this uh, facade is facing uh, southeast, south, uh, south, southeast, kind of risky. Uh, so uh, th there is also another par paradox: a museum with a delicate uh, exhibit inside is, as I said, is suggested to be sealed from uh, exterior. Uh, but here is Bosporus, so uh, we decided to use alternative, alternating a rhythm of openings, so that we complete the panorama of uh, Bosporus. Uh, using these, let's say, kind of refrained uh, type of closures and uh, openings. <clears throat> this is showing the context. Uh, I would um, elaborate on the context uh, Beşiktaş, the, uh, where the museum is located. It's a Bosporus village because uh, Bosporus still maintains the Ottoman, let's say, uh, urban, urbanism, uh, which I would summarize as uh, juxtaposition of villages aligned on the waterfront, uh, and Beşiktaş is one of those villages that is probably <coughs> closest to the city center <coughs> and uh, on the European side. So it is inevitably a hub for the rest of Bosphorus. It's a hub, uh, uh, in, uh, a transportation uh, interchange between uh, uh, let's say water transports and the asphalt and the public transport. Now uh, I think the, the, the rail system is arriving. Uh, also uh, embedded in a, in a series of towns. So it belongs to a palace uh, silhouette on the, on the Bosphorus. Uh, and because it belongs to the city center, it is exempt from the type of, let's say, urban code that R2 was telling you. Uh, because on the Bosphorus, it's forbidden to build a contemporary structure. Uh, the only contemporary, I would say, if, if I'm not mistaken, was the, the bridge itself, or the bridges built on the Bosphorus. So this was the very unique opportunity for architects to build something contemporary on the Bosphorus. I don't think there would be, as it stands now, uh, there would be other opportunities for architects to build something uh, not as a replica of an uh, existing waterfront kiosk. <clears throat> so, um, I think I will fast forward uh, these slides. It's showing you, you know, uh, we have, of course, um, let's say a horizontal movement that, that is parallel to waterfront. This is the boulevard connecting all the palaces, and this is Beşiktaş, it's obvious. 
We have a transverse axis, which is important because this is a valley. And this valley is, uh, at the same time, the center and of Beşiktaş and uh, the historical shopping area for Beşiktaş with the fish market and so on here. And it almost culminates uh, at uh, where we you know, take the entrance. Uh, so we created a small entry uh, square uh, in front of it, which, which was difficult actually because uh, this property belonged to the military and they are not used to that kind of traffic because what they do is they want to fence it. Uh, so we had to convince each and every, uh, let's say, admiral uh, to, uh, to leave it open and to uh, uh, open to the city. It was not easy because they keep changing every four years. So, it, uh, you know, think of it. We started in 2004. Uh, we, uh, they changed so many times. And each time they say, well, we are going to fence it. Probably in the future we will, you know, keep on doing this practice. And by the way, uh, the museum is not open totally. I mean, this part is built, which is the new part, the listed part, the existing still not open. So uh, uh, the, the circulation is not complete. OK, <clears throat> so this is that boulevard that I was uh, telling you. And then the palaces, uh, you see the, the boulevard scape. It's a very beautiful boulevard, as you see, especially these parts, surrounded by really old ancient trees, uh, walls bridges that are connecting uh, the palaces to the gardens uh, on the other side of the uh, boulevard. Of course, I mean, it's not the case. We wish it was the case, but uh, the implication is to connect the boat gallery, gallery the, the sh sheds, uh, to Bosporus. And uh, that's the, the type of fjords that I was telling you, the fractal. Uh, let's say, front, opening up to the Bosporus. At the same time, part of the palace silhouette system. Beşiktaş village, transversal axis, the square. This square also works as, you know, because we, we, uh, uh, we put the line here so that the existing building uh, uh, stands in the foreground uh, as the object uh, of the uh, of the composition. And uh, from this side, it is uh, the courtyard is framing uh, the the Beşik, Beşiktaş Square. Uh, today. It's a little bit deteriorated because of the, uh, the ramp that is connecting the big boulevard uh, to the uh, waterfront. Uh, but here there is a, a statue of Barbaros, Barbarossa, Barbarossa, uh, and this courtyard is framing that. <clears throat> and this is the section, the boulevard and the Bosphorus. Um, and it truly looks, uh, that is, I guess, the, the, the only building when you are, uh, let's say, on this uh, boulevard that you can see through uh, and you see the Bosphorus. Uh, so it uh, also acts almost like an optical uh, box here. Uh, that's why we, we treated the entry stairs down to the boat gallery because there's a level difference between the boulevard yeah. and uh, um, the Bosphorus, almost like a theater, uh, uh, like a theater it enhances uh, this effect of opening up uh, to, to the Bosphorus. So uh, the idea uh, here, it shows you uh, three-dimensionally uh, the circulation pattern, which is a 
straightforward museum uh, circulation scheme. Uh, the entry from the boulevard, not on the Bosphorus side, and uh, it spirals up to the second uh, level of the boat gallery where, where you can have a uh, second peak to the exhibit downstairs and also uh, the, the rest of the uh, inventory. And via a bridge you pass to the other uh, listed existing building and then you spiral down and uh, come back to where you started. It's a, a closed circuit circulation. And it, uh, as you see here, it gently touches the existing building, either a, via uh, a bridge, uh, which is a single story structure, or uh, just a single story, let's say, a ground floor uh, connection. Uh, so that touch is also uh, delicate. But uh, what here, uh, it is conveying you the idea that uh, during this promenade, it also acts like, uh, um, um, again, an optical instrument uh, for you to observe the city uh, through the openings. We're running out of time, right? Hmm? Are we cool? Okay. <clears throat> so uh, this is showing you, you know, the points and the vistas offered in the building. You know, the um, interesting thing, this is downstairs, the boat gallery. As you see, it's a space totally free of columns. There is a, a good contrast between upstairs and downstairs. Uh, f uh, downstairs is free of columns and Upstairs is, you know, it's polluted with uh, these structural elements. Uh, I don't know, you can choose. For example, in the competition, I was an upstairs fan. <laughs> no, for the, the ground floor downstairs. Uh, I don't know what's your place. Hmm? Upstairs, okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is showing you, uh, uh, as I said, a second chance to look at the boat from a different angle. This is the boat Arthur was telling you, a galley, uh, very old, more than 400 years old. Uh, it's a very singular uh, piece of exhibit and very delicate, of course. On the bridge, you go down. Some drawings, the basement, the ground. The gr no, still the basement, the ground floor where you enter, the boat gallery, the existing one. Upstairs, the mezzanine, connecting the bridge. You know, the mezzanine, we, we have auxiliary functions here, as you see. The side. <laughs> but then we shifted the orientation in order to create this. And as you see, you know, from inside when you uh, go to the building, you will, you will understand what these fjords are. Because here, there's the, this is infinitely uh, more facade. Starts from here, goes back. Now these movements where you know, we also provide some glazing. So inside and outside really mix. You cannot make which is which. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know, from downstairs you take this ramp up 
and then you come to the mezzanine and then uh, the bridge. Okay. The sections. And fast forwarding it because we are running out of time. Now, facing, we put some slides uh, for facing because it was important. As you see, it's a very limited site. Uh, and uh, we were not allowed to uh, use another site for the logistics of this construction. And we have very delicate uh, exhibit here, especially this one. And we cannot move it uh, three-dimensionally uh, so much, L level and uh, x and z direction, we cannot uh, uh, move it so much because it's very risky. Uh, it easily could be broken, so nobody took responsibility, we took responsibility for this thing, and we had to design uh, the logistics of this construction. How we can uh, construct this thing while keeping these boats on site. Plus there was another difficulty, if this is a channel which is collecting all the valley's water Eventually, the building is one meter higher than originally proposed. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So, uh, this is showing, you You know, we had to make a juxtaposition of the new building to the existing one so that we can, especially for this piece, uh, we uh, uh, design the logistics of how we move it. Uh, and we had to uh, demolish certain parts of the existing building to take this out because it was ad hoc built on top of uh, each other. So we, we built a temporary structure here. Uh, uh, luckily we moved it without breaking it uh, and we moved the rest. Uh, we built the boat gallery and we uh, removed the, uh, the temporary building and uh, finished up uh, the composition. And these are some, let's say, uh, photographs as of today. This is the uh, Bosphorus facade. You see the, these masses, the piano facade. Some photographs from inside. This is upper floor downstairs in the boat gallery, again downstairs. And, I mean, we tried to uh, accentuate the idea of these, uh, let's say, uh, vaulty, the ship sheds, uh, in the flooring, in the structure, the way we treat the finishings, also, you know, the skylights and all. <clears throat> this is the entry facade. You know, it is, it's a suspense because this huge wall suspended in the air, you, you enter underneath it, uh, creating that suspense. And it's a compressed space. And then it gets uh, more volumetric towards the boat gallery. This is uh, and the Bosphorus panel. <coughs> the materials in and out. Well, the couple are rusting outside. They are they stay <laughs> this shiny. That wasn't our intention. We 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 uh, proposed some kind of coating, but the construction company and the um, that setup was not the ideal setup, so uh, there are some accidents, uh, construction accidents in this uh, particular building. This is the entry uh, stairs. Okay, so um, um, I said uh, the entry is like a theater. Uh, it is actually used as a theater. 
uh, hosting a lot of events uh, at night when the museum is closed. Uh, there are, you know, a couple of events here. I don't know what happened here. This is a Bach concert. This is another concert. Uh, this is our presentation of uh, um, the Venice Biennale project we uh, designed for last year's Venice Architecture uh, Biennale, which is, I can link to what we have done in this uh, project, uh, because in this project, uh, in Maritime Museum, we had a beautiful uh, collection and we designed uh, a shed for them using the shipyard typology. Uh, and in uh, Venice uh, Biennale, the Turkish pavilion is situated in the Arsenal. And we, want, we were working then on uh, the Istanbul shipyard, uh, working on the master plan of it. So we wanted to make it uh, connect the two shipyards, uh, uh, Golden Horn and uh, Venice shipyards. Uh, via a design, so, so there, it, this case was vice versa. Uh, we did not have the boats, but the spaces. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I will be very fast here. So this is uh, uh, Golden Horn Shipyard, this is the ship shed, uh, and this is the Venice Arsenale shipshed, they are very similar. So this time we, the boat was lacking, we built the boat. <coughs> we designed this boat. And we took it back to uh, Istanbul Modern Museum, which is our show. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for this beautiful presentation. Um, I like the way Selva put it. It's really nice to introduce friends to friends. And uh, Amar, has, Amar Hamash, uh, our invited guest from Jordan, has been a friend of Studio X Hamman, but also of Columbia uh, School of Architecture for, for several years, uh, being very generous with his knowledge and expertise to students um, as a critic and also as a co-teacher here at the school. So it's great to have you back. Uh, Amar Hamash has been working as an architect, anthropologist, and artist for over 25 years. Both in, and um, after studying architecture, he uh, went on to study ethnoarchaeology. His work is celebrated both in Jordan and internationally for his knowledge of the landscape and geology of uh, the country and how he incorporates uh, this deep knowledge into his designs. He's an expert in local and practical building traditions. Uh, he's renovated many uh, historical structures in Jordan and the Arab world. Uh, and is an expert on innovative environmental and sustainable design solutions. I think one of the, um, maybe pausing here, one of the really incredible um, uh, aspects of Amar Hamash's architecture is uh, the way that uh, his designs interact with their environment in the large sense of the word, being both very specific uh, to their environment, but also having kind of a larger uh, position on uh, on this kind of positioning, right? On, on architecture's positioning in the world. In the context of this presentation, we'll be talking about architecture practice in the city, but both from within the city and without. Uh, so his work includes commercial projects, hotels, sustainable tourism, uh, residential renovation and restoration, cultural centers, landscape design and so on. Uh, the project that we'll hear about today is the Royal Academy uh, for Nature Conservation, which was shortlisted in the 2017 Aga Khan Award in Architecture. So join me in welcoming Martin. Thank you, Nora. Uh, I'll start with the, the site, uh, the bigger site. Um, this is uh, the central part of Jordan. Um, and uh, okay, and we are somewhere. The site is somewhere here, just to get an idea where we are in the bigger context. Um, 
this part is actually the greenest part of Jordan. It's the Ajlun um, mountain uh, area, which has uh, the highest uh, rainfall. And uh, we have to uh, also remember that, unfortunately, in the um, 70s, 80s, and 90s, it started to uh, be the uh, uh, target for stone quarries because the whole landscape is made from Cretaceous, um, not metamorphosed, but met not metamorphosed, but uh, rather hard limestone that Jordanians like it a lot, and uh, they polish it. They call it mar Ajlun marble but it's actually just nice, beautiful cream color limestone that, is, that brings um, the um, suppliers the best price in the market. Unfortunately, this has created um, a lot of holes in the mountain. Uh, if we are looking here, there's another one here. And like those two examples of about maybe 200 such cuts in nature. So it's a landscape that has been um, invaded by, this, by these wounds, you know, these cuts in the bone. And at the same time, the um, Royal Society of Conservation of Nature had this fantastic legal arrangement already in the 60s with the Ministry of Agriculture to manage highly, you know, high density oak forest, which is very rare. In Jordan, it's like Jordan has maybe one percent of its area is forest land. So this is like rather dense um, shrub oak. They are they are not tall. They're probably as tall as this building, maybe a little bit this floor, maybe like four meter, five meter at the most. At the most. Um, so the RSN actually, uh, the Royal Society for Conservation of Nature, then you know is is managing this site as part of their collection of about a dozen different reserves in, in Jordan. And the different reserves are covering the um, total biodiversity of the country. So they are in different um, ecosystems. Um, Jordan has a wide range of ecosystems all the way from Sudan Mediterranean in the Rift Valley in Wadi Araba, um, where also Dead Sea and Above it is the Mediterranean, which is this ecosystem, and then the Iranoterranean, and then the Saharo Arabian. And the beauty in Jordan that these four ecosystems sometimes get very close to each other, so that we can drive in half an hour between the four, four of them, um, and then find different uh, flora and different fauna. Um, I have to say that uh, I think important architecture comes from important clients because important clients listen and they don't uh, insist on ruining their chances. And uh, they also accept that you can revolt on the program or even the project or the intention and this is one of our latest tools. Well, I mean, it's not, I mean, this project started now, almost now eight years ago, but I've always been questioning the client's um, initial assignment. And late, about two months ago, there was another client government in Wadi Ram, and I read the terms of reference, they said, and I wrote my own terms of reference, I told them, look, I work if I do this, not what you have written, because, you know, sometimes you don't want to get involved in something that from the beginning, from the genetics of it, will, it, it will produce just a mediocre, lousy solution. Um, there in it, the client RCN actually initially uh, asked me to design a, 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 this um, uh, institution, small institution or academy, right here, inside, this is the line of the reserve. Of course, the reserve has a little bit private land in, you know, uh, encroachment like here, and, 
but, but inside the reserve they have a small lodges like tents now they became a little bit huts and a restaurant and they wanted to actually put the academy right here actually the story is even longer the academy was first in Azraq in the eastern desert <laughs> and then uh, uh, we were doing master planning for the royal court of all of Jabal Ajlouni on this whole area and then we with our saying decided okay we'd put it in Ajlun and then it was this was the site that was given and while driving to the site for two three trips and looking at it and finding ways of I don't know hanging the building above the trees or removing the trees or because the trees are very dense or you know have a building that is that has I don't know holes in it and so that the trees are growing in the middle of the spaces it's it's impossible. And then on the way, I always noticed this quarry. And I, funny enough, you know, I, I saw the quarry as a beautiful feature. Because I've been, in the last 15 years, obsessed with understanding how Jordan came to be geologically for the last 500 million years, and how every layer has been put in place and how it um, is now exposed. And that um, little wound here actually gave me a beautiful um, section. It's like, you know, somebody obsessed with medicine and you go into an open surgery and you see, an, a, you know, half a body cut in the middle. And so I, I you know, and, and I'm, as a fossil hunter and as somebody obsessed with paleontology and paleobotany and paleozoology and you know paleoclimates and the whole complexity which is which actually puts architecture into like one paper thin compared if we talk about geology is like it's a much bigger lens uh, and now Every time I have to switch lenses, but I find how small architecture is. Again, so those wounds are really fantastic. This is another wound, and this is another. So, you know, I've been driving this way and to the site, and then I told them, look, you know, I'm, I'm not designing the building there. So if I either do it here or I get another architect. <laughs> but, you know, I'm lucky I've done most of the buildings, so they now listen to me. Uh, now this quarry has been uh, abandoned um, in the 80s, late 80s. The government became a little bit more serious to, to conserve the land. Um, they've lost the forest here because the locals were cre clearing the uh, forest uh, vegetation cover to claim lands and, and get the land. But that was stopped already in the 80s and also like in the 90s they stopped this guy who's, you know, extracting stones from here. So this was just like an abandoned um, pit, if you will, um, in, in this beautiful uh, landscape. And this is less visible because you miss it when you drive this way. But, this, but we, when we come here, this is like, a, you know, a, a, a quite dramatic cut in the mountain. Um, I don't have uh, images of the site. I, don't, I do have images of the site before the building. I didn't put them, but uh, you can imagine that every time you would see, you know, that line right here, which for me was very, very impressive. You know, I, I always loved this beautiful elevation. It was like a found elevation. And it's something maybe has to do with Petra a little bit. You know how the Nabataeans found this beautiful, um, ninety percent of the city, you know, finished, and they just added their facades, almost like stickers, um, small reliefs and few, you know, um, spaces. But uh, and and adding the the ten percent, they gained the hundred percent. So for me, I feel that sites have already their own intelligence and their own, their own architecture. And and in my office, we always say that the site is the architect. I'm not the architect, you know, I, I'm a draftsman, or I help the site to draw, and I take the sites, I listen to the site, take the advice of the site, and package it to, the, to deliver to the contractors so that some, something meaningful happens. And for one reason, because, you know, I, if, we, if we look at, if we look at this, this elevation, which is 
the lower part of the total elevation, it's so complex, you know. If I want to draw, if I want to draw this, and on, on AutoCAD or whatever construction documents, and give it to any contractor, it'll, the, this, the file size will be impossible, you know. And, or the cost of building this, you know. And, and I find it um, so unfair how much we try to outsmart sometimes existing things that are so much more um, powerful than us. So the idea was uh, as simple as uh, saying to nature, look, we have wounded you, we have cut you, and now, um, sorry, we, we have to celebrate the cut um, and say sorry at the same time and, and actually enjoy, if you will, a, um, an elevation that just, you know, that complements the, the, the cut. And I always say um, that the elevation, the front elevation of this building was really designed by the last uh, mines or bulldozers or explosives because they drill in, in these quarries, they drill like vertical holes and they explode them. So whenever this was abandoned, the, the people who were in charge of that quarry never knew that they were designing an elevation of a future building because it's just, you know, I've followed the line. In fact, what, what I've done there, I went with a, with a, a spray, mar with a red marker, and marked the edge of the line. Uh, after the surveyor gave me their drawings, I marked a red line myself on the edge of the cliff and sent the surveyor again and, and told him, can you just, you know, pick that line and put it on your survey and uh, bring that line to my office. And this is what happened. Uh, so the building is very, very simple. I took that line, took the needs and uh, program of the client, put it in a, li in a wall, a linear, and just, you know, uh, along the line, as simple as that. And uh, the this elevation faces south, and Jordan uh, is very hot country. Can be very hot in, in some in the summer. This is the the nicest part of Jordan, but still, in the south, uh, I wanted just to make sure that uh, we have a back, a bone, you know, backbone, almost like a turtle back, if you will. So the building really is like a pomegranate, half open, and the opening is all to the north the opposite of, of this um, elevation. So this is the skin which really kind of continues, you know, and this, the red, red mark is here, and now it's fading. It was, you know, uh, for a while I could see it, but now it's all gone. So this is where the, the line happens. And what happens here is just I didn't want to extend foundation so we could save, you know, I, I, we did calculate. It's not morphology and it's not just form, but I just was trying to see how much um, we could stop foundation and take that concrete and just put it here as maybe you know wider um, side walls that are carrying the load. Um, and of course, this building has minimal foundation. It was a big. Um, um, pushing with the structural guys who are always worried for legal purposes. But uh, we try to avoid much foundation because this rock actually is as hard as whatever we do here. Uh, so here, this is the very simple non-architecture, non, just an envelope, really. And um, also, it, it has, whenever I needed a, a bit of lighting or Fenestration, I kind of hit it with these little, you know, sharp um, stones that really come to an edge like a blade. Um, and behind them, this would, would, would example would be um, a toilet areas that have like a small courtyard with some oak trees uh, left, you know, a court, uh, growing in, inside. And so to minimize uh, windows of, of uh, uh, such spaces, to, to become part of the front elevation. This, this is one, one, elevate, one solution. And also it actually does a good ventilation because this uh, works like thin fins and they collect the passing air and bring it into side, inside the building.
and you can actually uh, sometimes it actually they, they disappear completely and uh, and I like you know I like to uh, people to look at an elevation and see um, find this very sharp edges and you don't see the thickness it almost looks like um, a, a Photoshop you know and the people do, do this kind of like you know what's happening how do they it's like a little visual um, game but but these things actually you see in geology you know this um, how um, geology brings matter to to very very um, fine and uh, uh, sharp ends. The bridge is is uh, the entrance. We enter through a very simple. We cross the we cross the quarry right here with this bridge, and it's a big bridge. It's 30 meter, which is, if I'm not mistaken, the same span of the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul dome. Um, and it's a, it's a masonry bridge. It's a hybrid. It's masonry with reinforcement together. The stones work, and it has some reinforcement um, for a reason, because I don't want I didn't want to make the client pay for big blocks of stones. You know, I could have done it in the Roman, big you know uh, cubes of stones, but but those every stone will be because every stone you know if I would have made it those big ones, then uh, I think maybe that much of the bridge would be the cost of all, all of all of these ones, because these are just simple stones that we didn't even order for this bridge. We just took from the market, pre-cut stone, twin, 12 centimeter from any stone cutter, and I took the bad ones because they don't like the thick ones. Uh, so I told them, okay, I'll give me all the thick ones. The rest of the stones actually are the extras from the quarry, which were all dumped here. So this is all collected from here. Uh, those were from stone cutters from the surrounding towns, uh, because you know the the quarry the quarry takes the stone from here, they cut them and then sell them. But so those we have to take from stone cutter because we have to then you know put the alignment right. And this was also another thing to tell the structural guys that you know. Uh, you know, they, they draw things, but in, on site, I don't listen to them. I just throw their drawings in the garbage. And, uh, <laughs> because, you know, they, make, they, they, they dig all of this up, and they put reinforced concrete inside the mountain. And, and I always tell them, look, you know, I do like this. I don't need, I don't need to. I'm, I'm lighter than the bridge, you know. And I don't need to cut a hole here and put my hand in a niche. You know, because with all the friction, it's not going to do that, you know. It's a lot of lateral thrust in, in here, and the, and the quarry is bracing the bridge, and the bridge, bridge is kicking outwards between the two bedrocks. So there's not a, a chance of one millimeter of movement right here, and there's no bending in a bridge. And so anyway, uh, plus this is an important thing structurally, and uh, when the structural engineer uh, put steel, which I didn't look at, I only look at the side, at the end, how the steel is, you know, they worried about the cantilever, so. But then they didn't put any important things on the edges, and I insisted to do big bars on the edges for side buckling, which for in, in case of earthquake. So it became like a, a side rigidity to the. Uh. Also here, I um, um, was a little bit interested in the, here we see the, uh, you know, just touching nature. Um, what we did here, we cut very little at the beginning, and this is how the Nabataeans did the first stone. So you do the springs, if you want to call them. So it's just the angle the first stone has to sit at right 90 degree. And you don't need to do much cutting. You can cut a little bit here, and you can do a little bit stepping if you want, you know, just that it's, it's more perpendicular to the stones. Imagining that the quarry cliff is a stone of the arch itself, so as simple as that. This is how the um, um, site looks, and if you see the floor below the bridge, it's a fantastic sedimentation level. It's almost flat. It has, luckily, the right inclination, about 3% inclination uh, westwards, which means that it can drain itself very well. And that actually is a beautiful floor. It's, it's just a sedimentation layer that the quarry uh, stopped, um, uh, and they didn't take one more uh, stone layer uh, 
below it. And now we have we, we've cleaned it after uh, with water, so now it can be used for activities like vegetable markets and organic produce, uh, you know, for the villagers once every, at, at seasonal time. So and a car could drive, you know, in, in here, and uh, they could do some event, uh, especially like, you know, nothing permanent though. Um, Also here, I was interested in, in, the, in playing with, with concrete, um, very low cost. You know, I, I, don't like to, that, I don't like to spend money on architecture. I mean, RVC and the Royal Society for Conservation of Nature, they have to protect nature. They don't want, I don't, want, I don't think they should make iconic buildings. I mean, maybe they think this is iconic, but financially, it, you know, I don't like to, force them to bring very high-end contractors. This building per square meter costs something like $600. And it's, you can see the very cheap way of making it. This is just, you know, I, we specified for the contractor that we need to make, you know, uh, shuttering and then uh, with plastering, so he priced the boring typical item like any house in any village. And then I tricked him, I canceled the item of plaster, and okay, he got a little bit angry, but, but then also the edge, uh, it's like torn paper. And they were saying, oh, it's, it will fall apart. And I said, okay, I mean, uh, all of that has been falling apart nicely. So it, it is actually, when you tear a piece of paper, you see the fiber, you really understand how the paper is put together. And I, I like this. I don't like to design it. I like to design the process, but not the product. So it, it's now, as you can see, it really goes almost to zero, you know. And this is why we push the um, metal railing about that much in from the uh, knife edge so that, you know, people don't step on it. Even if they do, even if it breaks and shows the odd steel it's not the end of the world because, again, we have a lot of that happening here, and it's, as long as it's structurally safe, uh, you have no problem. That's the main entrance. And you can see here the end of the bridge. No tiling, nothing, just like a bone, one piece, monolithic, polished, very simple. Um, and um, also to save money, re reinforcement bars as railing, so the contractor doesn't have to go to a special blacksmith and, or buy different sections. Um, but again, I mean, it's, they're designed in a way that they don't bend and, and there's lighting here. Uh, so we do a bit of cheating sometimes. We add to the section some things so they can, uh, it can serve other, other purposes. This is where the building actually ends towards the west and it has this water, uh, this air um, channeling uh, funnel actually, and the whole building works like people think we have huge fans in the summer, which we don't. We just, if, if you open these windows and then the whole institute or the whole uh, academy is like, this, you, you actually, people always feel it in the main circulation. We have to remember that this building is um, like two thirds of it is institution uh, academy for teaching and one third is a restaurant, is a back-to-back -back academia and uh, hospitality or fine dining, if you will, so that the dining um, income can then support the education. And it's a, it's a beautiful combination. Um, also, because if we've done any academy, then we need already, you know, a cafeteria or a, 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 an eating place and a kitchen. So instead of doubling this up, we just made you know, a bigger kitchen and, and, and an eating area, so the students could have special meal, a cheaper meal for the students, etc. And here you can see those also you know, catching the wind from here. In here, I you know, played with the same detail. The, the, the concrete goes to zero and, uh, so that we don't have much elevation, you know, just that it does the job and then disappears without creating an elevation. This is the elevation that is to the forest. And actually here, again, whatever happened on the inside created the outside. Uh, this treatment was to pull our foundation away from the forest because the forest here drops very fast or very quickly down, downhill. 
and and we needed that balcony space because it's um, between lectures. You know, students have the meals, or they you could even have a cl you know uh, classrooms up here. And now they're using down as a classroom. You know, between the forest and the building, it's f smaller groups. But but this was all um, a, ne a needed space for outside, and it's very popular terrace. And I wanted to make sure that I'm not invading more with the foundation into the forest. So again, um, it's it's very it's very rough. I and mean, if you look here, you know, I, I I think the contractor was always very worried that I will come and you know cause trouble. And I kept quiet because for me it doesn't matter. You know, I kind of think that trees do that here. And maybe if this happens, I don't want to design it. I will never tell him to make it like this. You know, I. I tell him I want it nice and perfect, you know. But then when the shattering goes down, this happens and he's, you know. Uh, and then, you know, they start polishing the concrete because it was a little bit higher than the tiles because I didn't want the tiles to go to the edge. So they make dirt here and they panic again. And I said, okay, it doesn't matter. And or they're dripping here. Anyway, you know, it, it is a very rough building. Um, and I think in time, in, in Jordan, we get the Khumasin, which is the sandstorm that come out of North Africa and Africa. And this will become, uh, sorry, it will become more, um, it will become more uh, rock-like, if you will, uh, less, uh, less gray and maybe a little bit more golden color in time. Because, you know, cement, uh, concrete uh, grow, um, ages very nice, you know, it, it's, it's a beautiful material. Um, this is the space up where students are using it, you know, also for smoking, uh, breaks. Uh, sometimes they do special events and they put tables. Uh, the restaurant part is the other, you know, the other end of the building, uh, right there. And again, this you can see here the railing going away from the edge. Uh, as a, and here I was also playing with this, you know, concrete uh, fins where they just put the wood. Very, very simple, cheap. Any contractor of any village can do it. You know, we, we, didn't, we didn't want to have an urban expensive contractor. Again, if the money goes to education and to conservation, it's much better in, in, for, for a client like this. And uh, this way, I just wanted, I look at how people in the um, everywhere build ugly building schools, and I use the very technology that produces bad architecture, but that, that same techniques, I use it to produce something almost with the same price, but that is a little bit more meaningful. And again, you know, um, things happen, and uh, we just take decisions on the... Design actually doesn't stop, you know, un, until you finish the building and in fact sometimes continues throughout the life of the building and I don't like to protect my buildings you know if people want to change them in the future let let that happen you know I think buildings are, are alive and they should um, change and evolve and this is the uh, outdoor uh, seating area for the restaurant these shots now before the operation, before the place was operated. But here I have to mention the, the these columns go uh, about four meters down with, with found, one foundation, like these two columns have one foundation, and then there are, you know, there are um, branching columns that are, are like 45s, you know, because again, I didn't want to cut too many holes in the floor of the forest. So we actually mimic the trees, you know, they actually, if you go down, they look like trees. But you never see them. You know, I, I don't design for people to enjoy the beauty of my design. It's just, it's solving problems, as simple as that. And uh, trying to take permission from the trees to actually place our foundation between the trees and, and, and you know, um, tell them sorry, but uh, this is what can happen and uh, negotiate with them. And, and this is, again, you know, this, uh, I, actually took a, a, a yarn, a, a thread, you know, or a, a, like a, you know, a, a piece of uh, plastic tape, if you will, and I um, 
circulated myself the trees, the canopy, because uh, it's a bit complicated. Uh, I didn't want just the trunks. And actually, the, uh, the surveyor went back again, and I told them, okay, I need that line brought to the office again. Um, because I think the trees are, are, the, are taking design decisions here more than I. And this is why I took that uh, approach. Inside the building, it's a very simple linear building. You can see here the end with the restaurant area. And re when you enter, you go to the restaurant to the right or the academy to the left. And when you enter, you almost exit. The forest is in front of you. So there's hardly an entrance, really, very thin thing. And, um, and I don't like when buildings become dark in the center because we have a central spine, which all the students would go to the academy and then um, classrooms and even there's a craft room here for uh, local produce of the villagers, and there's admin. So all that spine, I wanted um, the hierarchy of uh, traffic. Or you know, when you go in a building, if you put signs in a building, it means that you have, as an architect you have failed. If you put arrows, it means that the building doesn't read well. You know. So here, when you enter, you immediately you can see the t restaurant tables on the right, the forest in front of you. On the left, you see that you know, um, sh uh, like a um, sheet of light that w w falls from the ceiling, and then you follow it. So, and this is like the main, um, you know, spine. Uh. Also here, I was interested in what happens with the light when it falls on different textures. Uh, and the way it produces like sound, you know, I have uh, something in my brain that mixes sound and sight. And sometimes I look at this and I can hear, you know, the light falling um, on those stones, which are also extra stones, nothing expensive, um, just to tell them that simple material, you can do that. And uh, they're end ending up, they're a bit slanted, they end up with about that much of glass on top. And the glass is not skylight, uh, aluminum, it's just a sheet of glass with silicon on the sides and just small hooks so that the silicon stays in place. Really cheap stuff, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this is the central spine that, um, and, those, and those actually make beautiful drawings, you know, on the, they keep Make me like a sundial. Uh, also, we made I made it a little bit uh, following the plan, but also you don't see it at once. It has again a bit of the seek in Petra effect. And again, you know these these solutions for me they come from my obsession in, in uh, stratigraphy and how rock layer uh, rock layers and uh, and how shapes and colors and um, that that form in, in this way. Um, also in situations like this where you can see water is actually making, generating forms and negative spaces and uh, finishes and textures. The whole issue for me is how nature makes shapes is, is a very, very big interest. And uh, I don't have to use it direct, you know, uh, in a very direct way, but it's always present in my uh, understanding of the bigger picture. And I think when I design, it always infiltrates and, uh, you know, and uh, uh, sneaks in um, design decisions uh, in, in, a, in a subtle way. Sometimes I... I only actually discover these connections when I'm talking about it, like, it, like today. I would discover something to myself, you know, when I'm showing my work to others uh, and I would see it for the first time. Thank you. Thank you both, um, or all three, uh, I think for amazing presentations. And um, I think, Ahmad, you said it quite beautifully that the site, in a way, it was a wonderful phrase, something about the site determining the architecture. Um, uh, you said, oh, the site is the architect, actually. And, and it seems that in both projects that 
on one hand, you have this amazing quarry that becomes a kind of constraint that determines the project. On the other hand, a set of boats that, in fact, really becomes a driver. But it's very much about the site of the Bosporus and its own history. Um, and I think they really point to a, a kind of dialogue around how the making of architecture really has to be engaged with a, a set of constraints that is is determining and allows the mind to, in fact, imagine what what buildings can be and become. And I was curious whether that has happened in other projects, and was there any point also in these projects where you really thought this is impossible, in fact, that the constraint was insurmountable um, in, in that regard? Um, I think the site is is not just the property. For me, for me, the site is includes the local knowledge and the local community and what is possible there. It includes the uh, climate, um, the vegetation, and the the bigger you know um, region, if you will, the East Mediterranean, if you want. So ours, we have one site. In, in a way, you know, between Jordan and Turkey, roughly compared to, to, to the rest of the world. So the site is, is like rings and rings and rings, you know, start from the bigger ring and uh, all the way to the, the very last ring, which is the property of the site itself, you know, physicality. But for me, the site, again, it's, it's the what is acceptable socially, what is acceptable uh, morally, you know, how much you want to put money in an area where people, uh, have, where there's a lot of poverty, you know, and the, the role of the architect not to try to outsmart or, you know, or um, um, kind of show, you know, show money to the local community. This is this is all part of the site, you know. And for me, I mean, the word constraint, I, it's for me, it's a, always a chance. <laughs> I, it's not a part of our dictionary. Well, I think um, archi one technique of architects, or let's say this discipline, is also it's not like you know it's uh, the the project is totally uh, uh, um, revealing what is already there or giving itself completely to the site, it transforms it. And uh, one technique is uh, actually to graft something on top of an existing site. You can import it from elsewhere. It could, it could look impossible sometimes uh, that it's not compatible with that site. But that is also one technique and uh, the, uh, the tension between what is existing there and uh, what is grafted onto it, it, be it landscape or a, an idea or a space conceived, uh, perceived somewhere else and uh, appropriated here. That creates a lot of energy and dynamism both conceptually and also after s certain time uh, physically where the site is. So. I would perceive, I would, I would also not like to rule, rule out this uh, possibility of architecture. Actually, you want to add something? Hmm? Yeah, maybe I'll um, uh, also on the, on the site, um, I wanted to maybe ask in relation to one of the questions that we were going to bring up is also something that you're both, both of the projects are working through is the notion of conservation uh, and you're both working through both through uh, natural but also cultural and historical elements that um, you know define define the projects and I was wondering how you would uh, approach the kind of divide between the natural and the, and the cultural and how that comes into the projects. I mean, specifically, for example, for Ammar, where um, the program itself is not only determined by, uh, you know, the the requirements of, of the clients, but also by the site itself. 
and and the climate um, and also the Bosphorus being very much part of the um, the, con the conception of the project. Um, uh, I come from uh, now even more more than often. I am uh, kind of on the edge of leaving architecture and going into botany and habitats and why certain uh, flora favors a certain parts of the landscape and how the landscape uh, ends up um, being the uh, demarcating itself in different lines uh, according to different species and different geology and different soil types. That state of mind is pushing me either, even further into the whole argument or dilemma or um, uh, uh, conflict of architecture that is endemic compared to architecture that is epidemic. Of course, the very urban, I mean, if you look at Manhattan, uh, that's another issue altogether, but uh, minus Central Park. But um, in general, I, I really believe that there is a lot of qualities and a lot of good chances to use very high technology and the latest of you know, design um, approach and design, uh, even augmented design, um, you know. Um, I'm not, uh, look, I'm not a traditionalist at all. I mean, some people in Jordan think that I'm the architect that does arches and, and rubble stone, but this is not the case at all. In fact, I'd rather take, you know, I'd rather take the, alt, the latest, you know, nanotechnology, if you will, and new materials, and, but at the same time, at the same time, go uh, super local or super hyper-local, you know, really zoom in and make sure that the ecology of the very, very specific site is, is making the uniqueness of that architecture. Otherwise, it becomes, you know, epidemic like what we see now all over the world. Um, you know, to look at it from another perspective, the preservation thing that you were asking, right? Uh, I find it interesting because it opens up a discussion uh, because when it comes to preservation uh, it usually puts us in a very awkward situation, architects, uh, because we cannot advise people to preserve something or not, vice versa. It's not an advice or it's not a, a decision that is arrived uh, it's usually a really strange uh, mode of thinking uh, where you oscillate between. There's not a categorical stance or uh, point of view there. It's, it's a discussion that is really you know, very intricate and very, and it, and it uh, sucks you in as a human being, as an individual, uh, and also the intricacies of uh, your tools, uh, your technologies, and the site. There you offer something, but it's not a formula at all. So that, it's a very tough, uh, let's say, uh, activity, preservation, and that part of our discipline. But it creates that very interesting uh, discussion. That's why I value uh, that part of uh, our activity. <laughs> no, I think I'm going to um, ask a couple questions about uh, the 
the building part of it because it seems like maybe um, some of the com um, the intentions and uh, the context and the way you both presented the projects I think were quite similar in some ways but then when it ca came to the the actual building um, and I know from uh, the Maritime Museum from being from Istanbul the process of it was actually not possible to be hands-on uh, with the project and what I'm curious actually um, listening to Amar's presentation where there is a chance to intervene in the site and where in the Maritime Museum there was probably very little a chance to actually be a part of the actual building, correct me if I'm wrong. And, um, and I, I take that there is also a lot of learning as an architect where you are not able to access the site. And uh, I'm very curious what you have learned uh, in that process that then uh, does it make it different now when you're working on the Izmir Opera House for example where again it will be a process where you won't have access to the site and Amar for you what happens when when you don't have access to the site uh, or do you go into projects like that in our case it was a very very unique and difficult uh, situation because uh, the competition was opened by Turkish Navy uh, and then when we uh, won the prize and uh, go for, for the contract, we learned that we are going to sign the contract with the municipality because they have some uh, older relationships. Uh, municipality gave some services, services to the Navy. So they said, uh, you are going to talk with us, but you will be paid by uh, municipality. And at the same time, these years, the municipality uh, uh, was somehow representing the conservative, uh, let's say, understanding in the, in the country and Turkish Navy uh, was on the secular side and there was a, a very a strong fight between these two institutions. So in all these meetings, I, I remember we were always in between uh, and they couldn't uh, give uh, any decision and uh, of course we were uh, always patriotic for the project but uh, trying to persuade uh, generally the Navy part for uh, for the uh, for some of the points in the project like Mehmet said the fences uh, around the border. On the other side, we were trying to uh, to get paid uh, by, uh, by municipality. Uh, that was really very st uh, a hard struggle. Um, but actually, uh, we we have been assigned as as the controller. Yeah, one <laughs> yes, <laughs> one year one year after the construction. But they, they don't listen to us, yes. Uh, but sometimes, I, I mean, I, when I turn back and look to the result, uh, I mean, if we wouldn't be there for that two years, the result would have been worse than this, of course. Uh, I mean, we did, uh, we struggled to be there, and uh, I, I, I see that today it was valuable. Um. But I think there's a mode of design uh, um, acknowledging that we are not going to be there on the site and they might manipulate what we have already proposed in drawings and models. There could be a mode of design. I think we were not prepared to that one that much. There are certain moves we did last moment, thinking of that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Should we uh, take questions from the, the audience? But I'm curious, Omar, do you go up to projects where you can't have as much hands-on? Or is this a unique experience, or is this a typical experience for you? Actually, it's... it's uh, yeah. 
Look, if, if the rules from the beginning that we are not to have access to the site, that becomes part of the site, which is the architect. You know, then we play by those rules and we design in a very tricky way. You know, we design that something can be built uh, without our control and with with less, you know, less possibilities where things go completely wrong. Probably by materials and technique of putting materials together. Um, maybe, but of course, we haven't had these cases, and I, I don't, th I don't think these are really very usual cases. You know, where architects don't have access to the site, or even, or even, you know, for me, I, I, I always retain the right to change anything I want across the whole building. I mean, except program or like major spaces, but uh, throughout the construction, I. Now I, we even have it in the contracts, you know, that it's, I can go and, of course, negotiate with the owner, whatever, but it's, if, you, you can't, you can't, um, you, you can't design a building like you're designing uh, a Boeing or a, a, an Airbus, you know, it, it's, that's a different class of, of design altogether. I mean, buildings are like trees. They have a site and they grow in that site and they change in that site and trees point their branches in different directions according to a dialogue that is on before construction, during construction, and even after operation. You know, they have to behave like a tree does, not like a car that, you know. So again, architecture is, is more connected to botany and cars and airplanes more connected to zoology you know, because they have no sight. Um, and for me, you know, I, it's, and I'm, I'm lucky because my clients now understand this kind of vision and they come to me because of it. So we have less of a problem. Yeah. And I like that you don't have the Turkish type contractors in your country. I think you should, you should defend your country against <laughs> Turkish contractors. Well, actually, some <laughs> no, some very uh, some very good stuff. Oh, the pipe from uh, DC was done by Turkish contractors okay. and Turkish pipes, but that's yeah. engineering and it's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Just wanted to see if we had any questions from the audience. Actually, this uh, this building is um, has been a continuation of an earlier building called Wild Jordan for the same clients, for the Royal Society for Conservation of Nature. And Wild Jordan in, is an extremely urban building, uh, which was built uh, now uh, 15 years ago, overlooking downtown. And downtown Amman is like San Francisco, is really sharp you know, um, mountainsides, and that building is, is very different. It's, it's, it's raw concrete, but it's uh, no stone uh, or very little stone, and it's just like two towers that have um, something that look like trusses out of uh, concrete beams uh, and, and tie beams. Um, but again, you know, it, it's a building that has been um, created to allow the downtown space to, be, to go under the building because it has two streets, an upper road and lower 
upper street, lower street, uh, with, with seven floor, a difference of seven floor, floors between them. And the lower street is very busy and has very bad access. So we connected everything on the upper, from the upper street and allowed a building to have, where normally a cube would have, uh, where a normal building would have four elevation or the roof would be fifth elevation. This one has six, six elevations because you see the bottom of it. Um, and, and the birds and cats and everything can go under, under the building. And now trees, by the way. Also the geology and the footprint of it is, is very minimal. Again, what trees do. I mean, trees can provide this beautiful canopy with very nice and shy and uh, low-key footprint. You know, a small trunk, but you look up and you have this fantastic canopy that is doing what all buildings should do, by the way. I mean, buildings should do the checklist of trees. They should collect the dust. They should, you know, take uh, CO2, trap carbon. They should provide food and shade and uh, habitat for birds and psychology and health for people. And I don't know, you know, you check the benefits of any tree on the internet and put them on a building. Uh, and they should collect energy and harvest dew and uh, all kind of, you know, probably 20 things they do and buildings should do that, and architecture should do that, or should, it should die, you know, in the future. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I would love to do a very, very urban um, um, project, and I, I'm, and I don't mind to surprise and shock people, um, but also shock them how a very, very simple technique and very simple material that is not imported and that is not, you know, um, something out of uh, some factory in uh, Stuttgart, you know, brought to Jordan. But it can. I mean, if this, if this was functional, I would even take, you know, high-tech German or Swiss material and use it, it, it. Fine. But I'm always surprising people that a very simple thing that they are using very badly everywhere can produce a very high-end, very contemporary uh, solution. <clears throat> Maybe I could add a, a question on the practice, uh, it's mostly directed to Mehmet and Atu. I think Selva touched upon it in the introduction. And I was curious to hear what the, let's say, the impact of the museum on your uh, trajectory of your practice have had. Uh, let's say, <clears throat> Istanbul as anywhere is, is very uh, commercially a driven uh, place. Still, you have managed to, let's say, create a portfolio or work of uh, body of work of projects that are not necessarily hyper-commercial, which is the typical uh, modus operandi in in Istanbul. Could you explain, or let's say, share with us a little bit how you you managed to, let's say, stay away from the the most hardcore uh, economical models? Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree with you. It's not very much common practice in our Turkish architectural scene to, uh, to work like this. Um, it's not easy. Uh, I mean, um, actually that was our intention, I think, uh, to work like this and not too much, I mean, kind of a resistance. Uh, but if you have, if you start the resistance and start behaving in a certain way as as a career throughout a career, things find you in that sense. It's, you know, we have the saying that you know, the the pot and its lid. Well, how do you call it? The pots and tenjere kapak. So you. The pipe finds the lid, you know. No, the, the lid finds the pot. Or the lid finds the pot. <laughs> Are we lid or the pot? <laughs> so, uh, you know, you start certain way and then things happen to you the other way. Uh, I mean, of course it's painful uh, a lot of the times, but, uh, you know, it accelerates itself. There is, uh, it, it has its own life almost. It's not like, you know, you are deliberately, consciously pushing it. Uh, life evolves that way. Uh, you just need to pull certain strings in the be beginning and then and observe it and stay patient and a little bit, you know, uh, strong. You have to stay strong. You, you, have, you have to cultivate your market. 
you have you you actually grow your clients in in time and you know you have what 20 years to do that and uh, if if you have an argument and then people start to say oh, okay i see you know i we agree and they get the right people in time i think yeah any other Questions from the audience? John, do you have anything else? Oh. Material, you have, uh, materials, uh, we had a different set of materials uh, proposed in the beginning, especially we wanted to use more wood. Uh, then uh, it got reje we got rejected. Uh, but the logic of it is important uh, because please note that a lot of the ship sheds built in Venice or in Istanbul, uh, actually the boat builders built it. Um, especially the roofs of it, not the masonry, but the roofs of it. It's almost like, uh, you know, a boat turned upside down. Uh, so, the, the, uh, you know, the, there are those times in a shipyard uh, where you don't make ships uh, because you need a defeat, a good defeat, so that you start building boats again. Uh, so, uh, in between, in the peace <laughs> times, they built roofs and these uh, um, spaces. So uh, I think without going in too much, too much too graphic, uh, let's say uh, our design is a type of a roof uh, or a type of uh, enclosure that is not as, a, as we described, not a, a box, uh, but strips and roof structures supporting it, which is about boat building. Because the, the idea of tectonics is coming very much from how you join the, mem the members of the boat plus uh, the ropes. Uh, so, I mean, it's very naturally fits into that when you have a structure like this. That's my take on it. Um, in addition to that, the continuation of the materials from exterior to interior is also important. Uh, you know, uh, we talked about the location of the project. It's a very chaotic spot in the town. I mean, for 24 hours, it's full of I mean, ferry traffic, cars, and people. Um, so we we uh, we don't want to uh, po uh, add this pollution with too many materials, and we we try to create a silence in the uh, in that spot. So we uh, the, all the the mass of the uh, maritime museum is like interlocking. Uh, three materials uh, uh, on the facades. They continue through the facade. The first is the stone. It's the pair of the historical building, sandstone. Uh, white is fiber cement, uh, the color of navy, we can say. Uh, and the last is the copper. Uh, uh, and copper is also a material that 
they should they, they use in uh, not old ships, but uh, I mean the Navy is familiar with this uh, material. I think we all the time do it. It's a practice, but we do it in degrees. Where uh, in the museum, uh, well, it's the the level is low uh, because we already had a, a, a existing collection. It would not increase or decrease, uh, so we almost designed it as a glove fitting the hand. Uh, but still, we made some moves and some. We succeeded. Some we didn't. Didn't. For example, we, we provided a very nice basement uh, in the competition for storage, and they they okay. Whenever you create a nice space, uh, they uh, yeah they want to use it. So they want to include it to the museum, which was totally out of the circulation of it uh, pattern that we proposed. So. And it was a little bit below sea level, so we proposed, okay, let's do this. Let's say you dive into it and you uh, you get up. So it, we, we, we thought that this is the best place that we can use the submarine uh, remains uh, uh, in the garden. And we, uh, we actually first convinced them. So we designed this underwater world there, but they did not build it, right? They said we sent the submarine. Yeah, they sent the submarine, and the submarine was no, no longer there. Uh, so, I mean, we, we, we did some, but in other projects, uh, we, we even changed the briefs, uh, the, the, the programs. It's all about, it starts there. They give you a brief, a program, uh, I wouldn't say only program, a brief or let's say a kind of scenario-like thing, and then uh, we manipulate it. We, you, you define it again for yourself. You don't take it like uh, a functional, let's say, diagram. Never. We always change it. <clears throat> Yeah. There are many stories, actually. <laughs> Some very discreet. <laughs> so I think we have time for one more. I think Pedro would like to. Uh, I have a comment uh, and a question. Uh, the first thing, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way. But basically, I think we're talking about two ways that you take possession over a project. Uh, one way, you 
that to you, and you mentioned it at some point, oh, some, some things went different during construction than even this conversation. Oh, some, some things they, they somehow take ways that we don't know. And, and Hamas said about, uh, okay, I tell them that it will be fine like this, but I, I was open that for this to crack and for the project to adapt and to change on time. So I think there's this, we are always between this tension on the project as something which is totally mm -hmm. controlled by the architect and that should remain like this, and the project which is open and will be transformed over time. And again, I don't, I, I don't think there is a right or a wrong way each way mm -hmm. adapts to a, to a certain situation. But Amar said one thing in the very beginning of his presentation about the, he said that important projects have important lives. And, and I think that uh, this, is, this is, totally, is totally true. I mean, sometimes the smart clients, they confront us, they make us change the process. Sometimes we feel frustrated in the first moment, but then we, we start to understand that they have uh, a knowledge about what they are talking about and they push us to, to go further. So my question is, I mean, what do you expect of, of, of both of you? What do you expect a client to see on this? What, what do you think is important? that a client recognizes on you, of course, beyond the capacity to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what do you expect? I think uh, clients should be looking or shopping for methodologies uh, for firms uh, or offices or individual architects that have methodologies but not a style. Um, and uh, and definitely offices and architects that don't have like you know a superstar international brand, if you will, that becomes a jail to everybody, but also a very good milking cow to the owner of that brand. I think you know both of these projects are come from a genre of architecture and architects that are working the hard way, you know, because we have to reinvent the wheel every time. It's not like we have um, any, f you know, um, finished um, program or methodology or style or anything, you know, and, and it probably would be much more well off if we would have, you know, um, a, a good office library and that has some kind of, um, I don't know, you know, I, I think a, a, a good client should actually um, put the hierarchy and the order right in terms of how much to spend on that site and what kind of statement that you want to do out of that site to the general, to the public and whether urban or, or rural. But now in this world, there's very little division. I mean, even rural buildings have an urban, in fact, the building in Ajloon, the, the Users are all urban people. You know, they're not the villagers. The villagers can use it, f probably get some employment and sell some of their produce. But most of the receiving of that experience are people who come from the city. You know, so again, I, I think that quality of clients to um, not look for a, a monumental building or for an image that will publish well on a cover of a magazine. I and mean, if you can educate the client to think on these lines and not look for a fashion architecture as fashion, but architecture as humble and some degree of modesty. All architecture should have some degree of modesty, and when it loses it, it becomes a nightmare like big names that, that I don't want to mention. <laughs> you know, I don't believe it's always nice to have a loving and kissing relation with a client, uh, it's not interesting. Sometimes it's a lot more interesting when people confront each other and change certain things. So what you would look for, for me, is the capacity to transform. But that cannot be one-sided. For example, I am expecting from the client a capacity to transform, to change, show that flexibility throughout the process, but then I have to, uh, I have to for myself, 
I have to show that capacity to my client too, to be able to change, transform in the process. Uh, as long as I, and I start with it probably, so that I create an appetite for it in the other person. Uh, for me it's not always very good, it doesn't result always very good, you know, to work with a client who is a little too much like you and you love each other. I don't... It would be nice sometimes to have so some. So no romance. <laughs> no romance for you. <laughs> I, I think that it's, tr it's really the dialogue, that, you know, when you can be educated by the client, but the client is also educated by you, that good projects actually emerge. But I just wanted to take the time to thank our tag and Mehmet, also Amar, Salvan Gregors, and Nora, I think, for really illuminating um, conversation. Uh, I also wanted to give a special thanks to Paul for all the help setting this up, and Malvina as well, and, and um, the AV crew for um, helping us out today. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>